Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 19th of December. Today's topic is Hour of Code Extensions. Our special guest is Vicki Sedgwick. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Uh, Maureen is going to introduce Vicki for us and ask the newbie question that's on the next slide. Great. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. I didn't have time to test the mic. So if you can't, shout it out. Oh, good. OK. Um, well, I have never actually met Vicki in person, but I feel like I know her from years and years of following her on Twitter. I first met her online on Twitter. We had very similar jobs at the time and had a lot of the same interests in teaching on a computer class. I was also lucky enough to work with Vicki back when I um, helped work with the Flat Classroom Project. She brought one of her classes, or several of her classes, on board. And I continue to follow her ideas as she co-moderates the CS8 weekly Twitter chat. And when I was looking for ideas for Hour of Code for the kids at my school, she was one of my go-to people to check and see what she was doing. Vicki currently works at St. Martin's Episcopal School in California's San Fernando Valley as a K-8 technology teacher and as a tech trainer. As a former software designer and computer programmer, Vicki is very excited about the current STEAM movement in education, especially when it comes to introducing K-8 students to the world of computer science and coding. She loves to share about computer science and coding not only with her students, but also with other teachers as she moderate, co-moderates the CSK8 Twitter chat. And she also presents at conferences, Q, EdCamp, and other events. It's my great pleasure to bring Vicki, Visions by Vicki, Vicki Sedgwick, to Classroom 2.0 Live today. So the newbie question. Today's newbie question is, what is coding? And why is it important for students to learn how to code? And over to you, Vicki. Thank you, Maureen. Wow, I don't know that I can live up to that intro. But um, so looking at the newbie question, what is coding? Well, a lot of you, I think, probably already know, because it looks like most people have done some of it. But um, in reality, what it is is how people tell a computer what to do using step-by-step -step instructions that the computer will understand. Um, you'll often also hear the two term programming. And for our purposes, we're, we're going to equate them. We're going to say they're um, <coughs> synonyms. But computer science experts often argue that fact. And they can get into very heated debates about it. But we'll call it synonymous. And a computer isn't necessarily just that laptop you're on, but it's any device that you can program, things like tablets, phones, robots. And why should students learn it? Well, when students are coding, they're learning and practicing a lot of transferable skills, like decomposition, breaking a problem into smaller parts, sequencing and algorithm building, which is creating a solution to a problem in logical step-by-step -step way, perseverance when things go wrong, they have permission when they code to fail and try again, and sometimes again and again, and communication and collaboration skills. I think all these are very useful skills in any curricular area. Um, but And a lot of us I saw participated in the Hour of Code, but just an hour isn't um, isn't going to do it. So we're going to talk today about extending beyond the hour of code, how to go <coughs> beyond just an hour and do, um, and do more. As Maureen said, I'm a K-8 tech teacher. And I'm really lucky because I can create my own curriculum in the computer lab. And so I devote at least a quarter of the year to computer science. And I have for the past three years. Before that, um, my middle schoolers were coding for two or three years before that. For my school, the Hour of Code is a kickoff for our larger computer science units, which start in mid-January when our third quarter starts. 
And I hope today will inspire you to join me in doing more computer science with the students that you serve. So Steve Jobs um, once said, everybody in this country should learn how to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. He didn't say everybody should be a computer programmer. He said everybody should learn how to program. I often hear arguments from people about um, teaching coding, and they say, well, why should we teach it? Most students aren't going to grow up to be computer scientists or programmers. And yep, that's totally true. Most won't. But that argument um, could be made for a lot of the subjects we teach. Most students don't grow up to be doctors either, but we still teach biology. In part, we do this because it teaches about life. Well, if you look at the lives of your students today, most of them are surrounded by technology and computing devices. And it's amazing when they can learn to control those devices rather than just be controlled by them. Computer science con concepts are valuable no matter what a student ends up doing in their life. Uh-oh, throwing around another term, computer science, most of you may be familiar with it, but some may not. Um, the definition of computer science according to the ACM CSTA model curriculum for K-12 schools is the study of computers and algorithmic processes, including their principles, their hardware and software designs, their applications, and their impact on society. Coding isn't mentioned specifically in there but it is a part of computer science because it's an algorithmic process. Um, I hear a lot of people say, oh, but I don't know anything about computer science. How can I possibly bring this into my classroom? It would be great if there were dedicated computer science teachers in every school, but there aren't, at least not yet. So until then, other educators have to pick that up and um, teach it or teach some of it. And there are, we're very lucky today because there's a great number of resources available. And I think there's something new that pops up you know, almost every week. And um, it helps us as educators to teach and integrate computer science into existing curriculums. So today we're going to talk about a few of the options that are available. There are so many, there's no possible way to cover them all. So first, I'm going to start with the one-stop shop. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Code.org because they've done Hour of Code, and they've done the Hour of Code tutorials. But if you want to include computer science in your classroom or school, and you have teachers that are apprehensive or that don't know anything about computer science, these courses are great because you can just pick them up and have a complete course. It teaches fundamentals starting with our youngest students. If you notice, course one says it's for ages four to six. There isn't any reading involved. It's arrows and things like that so that they can complete the online task without having to know how to read. Um, teachers can set up accounts and add students to classes. Emails are not required for students, um, but they can be used. Like if you have older students that have emails, then they can sign up via email. For your younger students, you can have it be as simple as putting a link up that they go to and they pick the appropriate picture for their account. Accounts aren't really required. You can do an entire course without the accounts, but it really helps to set one up because you can see how the students are doing. You can see if in a specific level they completed it with the recommended number of blocks, for example. You're not going to see that if they're not signed in. I often hear from people when I point them to this page, well, that's great, but I still don't know how to actually implement it. I still don't know how to do it. Well, 
if you're in the U.S., um, Code.org offers free PD for their elementary courses. Um, you can check out the location and find a workshop near you. It's on code.org slash professional dash development dash workshops. It's in the live binder. The really cool thing is if you go to one of those workshops, you actually get free stuff. Each of the courses has unplugged lessons in it, and you get the stuff you would need to implement those unplugged courses. For example, in one of the courses, you, uh, one of the unplugged items uses dice, and you get the dice. So it's great. You don't have to go out and spend any money in order to complete the unplugged exercises. If there isn't a workshop offered near you or you're not in the U.S., there's an online course that's at studio.code.org slash s slash, and then in all capitals, K5PD. That's also in the live binder. I don't think you get the free stuff with that one, though, but you get the information. So if you go to um, studio.code.org and you click on one of the courses, you're going to see all of the lessons for the course, whether you're logged in or not. Each of the courses has unplugged non-computer activities, like learning about loops through a dance. They're great to teach in a classroom, whether there's technology available or not. Um, in my school, the technology is pretty much in the computer lab. We don't have the bandwidth to support it in classrooms. So the teachers can't really do things that are hands-on but they can do the unplugged lessons in the classroom. They're clearly identified as an unplugged lesson, and there's a whole guide for how teachers can implement it. Um, they typically have vocabulary and some kind of activity that the students complete along with discussion questions. They're meant to introduce the concept that the students are then going to practice online. When you have access to technology, the students sign into their free account and do the online activity. Then um, when you're logged in, you can see what the students have completed. And it knows where they left off. So if they leave off in the middle of something or if they're absent for a day, you'll know which students still need to catch up. So if you still have a computer lab in your school like we do, and designated time in the lab, they're great because you can divide the work up between the classroom teacher and the tech teacher. Um, the classroom teacher can do the unplugged in their class, and then the tech teacher can do the online portion. Or if you have a computer lab without a tech teacher and you go to the lab, then you can do the online portion when you go there. Or if you're a teacher with only a few devices in your classroom, you can do the unplugged as a full class and then set up a center that has your devices in it and the students can log in as they go through the center and complete the online portions. So it's really well done for any kind of tech. Of course, if you have one-to-one one -one devices, it's easy to integrate because you have the devices available. Um, if you notice, they go through age 18 but they are pretty basic, they're pretty fundamental. So if you're looking for something more, for example, at the middle school level, Code.org also has um, two middle school courses that offer direct integration to Common Core Math and the Next Generation Science Standards. There's one called CS in Science, and it covers the um, NGSS standards using Star Logo, which is at slnova.org to program simulations and models. There's also computer science in algebra, which is directly correlated to Algebra 1 and I believe Algebra 2 now. And it uses something called Bootstrap, which is at bootstrapworld.org. And it's aligned to the algebra curriculum. And then in high school, you may also use the Algebra 1. Um, but you, if you're getting into more real, what people consider real courses. Code.org has developed materials for the new computer science principles AP course. It's going to start in the fall of 2016. And they, what I really like is they've created some great videos on computer science concepts. 
which work well to introduce um, any of those concepts in the CSP course, but I find they're also great with my middle school students because they're a little more in depth than some of the other things, and so they work really well. Even if you're not doing the code.org courses, but you're doing something else and want to introduce a concept. So I teach in the computer lab, and we have desktop PC computers. I also have access to uh, a few tablet devices, but I mainly use those for um, the hour of code and to program um, some robots and drones. For the most part, the coding that my students do is done on desktop computer. This works fine for grade three and up, but in my opinion, I think the best coding options for pre and emerging readers, those younger students, really are apps. And um, with the exception of code, with the exception of these code.org courses, they're really good, and I do use them with my younger students to introduce these concepts and get them started um, with computer science. We'll talk about the apps, Maureen. So in addition to the uh, actual courses, there's all the Hour of Code tutorials, right? I mean, you may have done like I did this year. These are some of my students. These are my third and fourth grade students use the code.org Minecraft tutorials this year. And my fifth grade students use the Star Wars, the JavaScript version this year. Maybe your students did some of these also. Um, you can use the accounts also with these tutorials and track student progress. Um, if your only exposure to code.org was the Minecraft or Star Wars tutorial, you may not be aware that they have a lot more of these. Um, they have the Frozen one, which was really popular last year, their old classic one, the Angry Birds one, which was their first year they were open. They have a Flappy Code one, which lets you create a Flappy Bird game. And then they have the Play Labs and the Artist Studios. And the each of these is, is a series of puzzles with um, videos to introduce the concepts. So there may be a video to introduce loops, for example, and things, or conditionals. And then when they get to the end, there's a creation level where they can create a game in whatever the, um, the, the theme was of the tutorial that they did. They're all meant to take about an hour to complete. And um, so how do you use these beyond the hour of code? Well, for me, they are on my list of things my students can do when they're done with something. I always have to have things available for them to do for those fast finishers. And these are on that list. So they can log into their account and work within one of these tutorials, um, a different one than they've worked in before. Or if they feel they know the code, they can go right to the creation level and create their own game or their own art artwork. Um, you can um, also use some of the unplugged activities that were included in the in the code.org courses and make your own unit around one of these. Let's say you want to use the Infinity Play Lab because your students like those characters. Um, you could go through it yourself, find out what the videos are so what concepts they're teaching, and go and pull some of the unplugged activities specifically for those concepts and do some unplugged activities right around um, one of these hour of code things, extending it, making it longer, making it more a unit of coding rather than just a one hour everybody on their own computer. All right, next up is an app. Um, is Codable. Uh, Codable was originally designed for kids K to 5, but it can also be a fun way to introduce a concept even to older students. I actually know a high school teacher that uses Codable with her students. Codable uses arrows and um, to code. There's no words, which means you don't have to be able to read um, to, to create um, algorithms and solve the levels. We have a preschool at our, at our school, but I don't work with those students, so um, 
the hour of code is my kindergarten students' very first intro to coding. And I always start with Codable. It's very accessible for them. Um, and it works on a lot of different devices. There's apps. Um, there's an Android app. There's iOS apps. Um, and there's a browser version and even a download version. Um, like I said, I mostly work on computers, but when I'm using Codable, I do use the app version. I find in my um, in my in my lab, uh, the app works much better than the browser version. Um, we have older computers and not a whole lot of bandwidth, and it can be slow. So I like the app version. Um, if you notice, these students are working together, um, and that's intentional. Even if I had one-to-one -one iPads, um, I would pair them. Um, pair programming is a big concept, and it also helps them learn um, other skills. I pair them intentionally. I don't just hand two of them an iPad and say, here, do this. I give them jobs. The student who doesn't have the iPad is in charge of looking at the puzzle and then telling the student with the iPad which arrows they should pull in. And then the student with the iPad actually brings the code in and pushes the go button. They're both responsible for debugging if it goes wrong. This way it keeps them both engaged. And they switch at each level in my, in my classes so that you know, the first, so that they each get the chances to hold the iPad and to solve levels. So, um, the Codable also is great because it has accounts. You can set up a free teacher account and set up classes and track um, across whatever device they're on. So if you use the browser at school, or sometimes they're on iPads, or sometimes they're on an Android device, they can log in on all of those with the same account, and it'll keep track of where they're at. You do need internet access to do this. Um, so if you're going to use the accounts, you have to make sure that all of your devices are connected to the internet. There are also paid accounts. Um, at Codable that allow you access to more levels. Um, you only have access to the first 15 levels, the basics of coding, for free. Um, there are school accounts, and they'll give you a quote on that. They're fairly reasonable, and they'll work with people and try and help you get funding if you um, don't have it. Um, it's great. I even send the codes home with my students because um, they, they often have tablets at home. And so even though we may not do a whole lot more codable throughout the year, um, we do some. It's, an, again, another thing that we add into coding rotations. Um, I like to mix it up a little so that my students aren't, don't say, oh, we did that last week. Um, it still can teach them things. Um, and they also have curriculum. The great thing about Codable is they have built-in curriculum that will tell you what it is you're actually teaching. Um, they have materials available right now for kindergarten through, I believe, third grade, and they're currently working on upper elementary. They contain background information for you, the teacher, vocabulary to teach, unplugged lessons, discussion questions, and information about which levels the students will be completing to go with this concept. The really cool thing is if you have accounts, you can put a stop on each of the students to say when they hit level five, for example, they need to stop so that they don't continue into the next concept until you've done the unplugged offline teaching about what the concept is they're going to use. Um, it's been helpful to me because I have students that will rush through it. Um, they. Uh, to me, it's important that students not only play the game, not, they don't only play Codable, but they have the vocabulary available to talk about what they're doing. We use proper vocabulary when we teach other things. We wouldn't call a noun something else when we're talking about nouns in um, language arts. So when we talk about um, building an algorithm, building a program, we should talk about sequencing and algorithms. We should talk about events um, so that the students hear those terms and learn those. 
Yep, the Seuss is next, Maureen. So, as Maureen mentioned, the Seuss. Um, these are my some of my first grade first first graders using the foos. Again, you use arrows and other icons to build each program, no words. Unlike Codable, um, I found that unlike Codable, where most of my students end up with three stars on each level, in the foos, it's tougher to get three stars. They have a tendency to um, program it piecemeal in the foos, because in Codable, you have to get the entire um, algorithm correct. The whole program has to work or you start the level over. In the SUS, I can move somebody one space and then I can run that program again and move them a second space and run it again and do a third space. Um, so they don't always get three stars. So I talked to them about trying to strive for three stars. It was interesting this year when I brought that up. Um, the little girl that is kind of hidden, said to me, well, it's not about winning, it's about having fun. <laughs> um, well, that's true, but in this case, I want them to try and still get three stars if they can, because then um, they're trying to write an entire program, not trying to do it one step at a time. You can create up to three accounts on one device. Um, there's no way, there's no teacher dashboard right now where you can look up how all your students are doing, so you'll have to check on each device. New this year is something called Foo Studio. If you look at the girl in the foreground, she's playing in Foo Studio. It's a platformer type game, um, similar to Mario, and it lets students create their own levels and they can share those and play one another's levels. It's um, very engaging for the students. Um, I plan on using the foos throughout the year. One note on this for right now, if you have um, Chromebooks, the Foo Studio won't work on Chromebooks. It requires the Unity 3D plugin, and you can't install that on a Chromebook. Um, they're working on a solution um, to allow that, but for right now, you can only play the puzzle levels. Oh, I like the rug, too. Um, Foos does have curriculum. Um, there's curriculum available for the Hour of Code, which is just a, a limited one. It's, it's um, an alligator game that they create. And then there's curriculum available for their entire um, uh, uh, their entire game. And again, it includes things like offline lessons, unplugged lessons, vocabulary, um, ties to um, standards, the standards, um, and uh, questions, that discussion questions. They also have, and so does Codable, a solutions guide. So if you get stuck <laughs> and don't want to look foolish in front of your first graders, um, download the solutions guide. And in fact, I would suggest it for the foos um, because I've found that adults tend to overthink some of the levels and have a harder time solving them. And there are many, many, many more of these puzzle type apps and websites, but most of them don't have curricular materials the way the ones we've talked about do. That means you, that doesn't mean you don't want to use them. It just means you may have to put curriculum together yourself. You can supplement with your own unplugged activities. Code.org is a great source for those. Pull them out of their courses and use them with other things. Um, I also have three documents. This kind of shows you what they are. They are in the live binder. There's one that talks about coding on iPads that has a lot of computational thinking games, these puzzle type games. There's one that talks about resources for Chromebooks, laptops, and desktops, the same kind of thing. And then I also have a third um, spreadsheet that talks about unplugged activities and how they tie to a concept or skill in coding. Like there's a whole bunch of links to different um, types of uh, unplugged activities you could do for algorithms, for example. Um, they are, yeah, I, I agree, Peggy, don't put that in there. 
So there are many, um, many types of things like that. So go through those. They'll be a great help if you're trying to put your own uh, curriculum together. Um, another great person in the tech field is Mitch Resnick. If you don't know Mitch, he's the director of a lifelong kindergarten group at the MIT Media Lab. And he has said that kids are learning to code, but even more importantly, they're coding to learn. This is so true. If you ask anybody who programs for a living, they don't write code just to write code. Um, they're trying to solve a problem or to do something. Once our students get through the basics and they know how to write the code, they know how to put the blocks together, they know how to syntactically do code if they're getting into text-based languages, then they can actually use that code to do something. They can solve a problem, they can demonstrate knowledge in some other curricular area, they can just be creative. So we want to get them to the point where they're actually using code to do something. If you don't know anything about Mitch Resnick, um, you should take some time to watch his TED Talk. Um, I don't know if that's in the live binder. If not, you can look that up. Just look for TED Talk, Mitch Resnick. Um, and he also published an article recently on kids and coding called A Different Approach to Coding that talks about coding to learn. Um, the previous apps and websites were mostly about teaching kids to code. Some of them had a creative level, but they were limited by what the tool was. Um, what we're going to talk about now are things that let the students start with a blank slate, let them create. So the first one is Scratch Junior. Scratch Junior is one of the reasons I wish I had more tablet devices. Um, I still would pair students, um, but Scratch Junior is pretty awesome. It's available on the iPad and Android tablets, as long as you're running 4.2 or above. Um, and it's free. Um, everything from the Scratch from the Media Lab is free, and Scratch is one of those things. Um, Scratch Junior, even though it's geared to, it was written, it was written to address the need of pre-readers and emergent readers. But you can use it with older students. It can be a great way, again, to work through a concept. Um, if you have a student that isn't getting loops, for example, in something else, sometimes removing the words helps them get it. Um, it's a great uh, I'll talk about one thing that I do with it that even my older students um, like to do. It's kind of a just really quick, fun project. So if you look at the image on the left, um, that's what the app looks like um, when the students are, are using it, are coding, other than the little bubbles aren't there, because this is the interface guide. Um, if you, um, you can see the, an interactive version of this interface, um, guide. If you go to scratchjunior.org and you click on the learn option, there'll be an interactive version of this and you can click on each of the bubbles and it'll tell you what each of those things mean. We're going to talk about a few of them. What you see um, under number 16, those are the characters. Think of this like a play. Scratch Junior is great for storytelling and so these are your characters. These are the things that are going to interact in um, the program that we're creating. Each of the characters can have a program. Um, you can add all these characters that you see can come from the, um, from the Scratch Junior library. But students can edit them. There's a little, if you, if you look at the cat, you'll see a little paintbrush. They can paint that cat and change its color or add something to it. Um, they can also paint their own characters. So it can be an expression of art also where they're creating their own characters. Um, and 
some of the characters have no faces. They're like an astronaut with no face. And they can use the camera on their device to take a picture of their face and make it the character's face. So they can really customize it and make it their own, even starting at the character level. The backgrounds, like that, that uh, hilly um, background that you see, is also from the Scratch Junior Library. Again, they can customize those, they can paint their own, and they can use their camera to capture their own. Each of the characters needs to be told what to do. And the students do that by creating a programming script, which is number 12. That's one of the programming scripts in the programming area. And to do that, you just drag down the blocks and then snap them together. It's like a puzzle. They go together. In this example, the cat has actually two scripts. One of the scripts runs when the program starts, which is the green flag one. When you click the green flag, the cat's going to move. It's going to move and jump. Then when you touch him, He's going to repeat an action four, four times. So he's got two scripts that will happen. Each of the other um, characters that you see could also have scripts. They may not. It may be that they're just there, and the cat interacts with them, but they don't do anything. Um, there are five different, there are different categories of blocks. Uh, the yellow ones are the event or triggering blocks. Um, and the blue ones are motion blocks. The purple ones are looks blocks. That also includes speech bubbles, because when you add a speech bubble, you change the way a character looks, where they can actually type in things for the characters to say. Um, sound blocks are green, where they can actually record their voices. That can get interesting. And control blocks, things like repeats or waits, are orange and end blocks so you can end your program or go to the next um, scene if you have multiple scenes um, are the red blocks. One of the first things I have my students do is learn to make a character move as in the example on the right. I just wanted to point out the grid. If you look at the image, you'll see something, a grid that's overlaid over the top of the um, of the screen, and students can turn that on and off. Um, moving the car isn't a math lesson in, an, in and of itself, but it becomes one when the stu student turns on the grid. And they can count the spaces across in order to change the number under the blue move block. Um, if a student wants to start, the co start their car in position one on what would be the x-axis, and then they want it to end at position 19, then they can count across when they're young. When they're older, it can become a subtraction problem. And you can start talking x and y with them, even though they're not really using those coordinates yet, but it's a really gentle introduction to that and help will help them later on when they'll go, hey, we did that in Scratch Junior when I was in second grade. So what can a student do with Scratch Junior? I'll be honest, first you need to spend some time getting the students familiar with Scratch Junior and what it can do. You have to spend that learning to code time. The activities under the teach option on scratchjunior.org are a great place to start. For example, the Hour of Code this year, my goal was that my students be able to create an animated holiday card. So we started with that um, driving your car so that they could make whatever character was going to be in their holiday card move. <clears throat> then I showed them the, um, speech, uh, the speech bubble under the looks block, and I showed them how to record. And then they created an animated holiday card um, in, uh, in Scratch Junior as their final kind of project for the Hour of Code. Um, they were short, but they were able to do it. It's great for any kind of storytelling. They can write a story done totally offline before they touch the device, and then they can retell it using the animations in Scratch Junior. One of the things that I like to do is an all about me project. So they can either draw themselves, or if you're allowed to do student faces along with other identifying information like the first name, they could 
use the camera and put themselves into one of the characters, and then write something that talks about them rather than putting an all about me poster on the wall. This is one that even my older students like to do, and they love to use the camera <laughs> and make themselves a character. Um, we know that in Common Core, students should be able to explain how they did something in math. So they could use Scratch Junior and their device to take a picture of that math work that they just did and bring a character in that explains how they did the work. Um, in Scratch Junior, you can email or airdrop on iPad the Scratch Junior project. So you can also use it for guided lessons. As a teacher, I could set up um, a portion of a script and then airdrop um, or email if it's Android tablets to all the student um, tablets and have them start with that template and then finish the program. A friend of mine, Sam Patterson, has a great blog post about this. It's called Teaching Reading Through Programming Sight Words, and it's at teachercast.net. It's also in the live binder. And think about it. One student could start a story or create a coding challenge and airdrop that to another student who then has to finish it. And now you have a collaborative programming project with your primary students. There are other great curricular ideas under the curricula. Um, portion of the teach option on scratchjunior.org. Scratch. As they get older um, and they learn to read, then they can get into Scratch. Scratch right now is um, only browser-based. It works on desktops, laptops, and Chromebooks. Um, you do need an internet connection for Chromebooks. You can download and install it on laptops and desktops and run it offline, completely offline if you need to. Um, I love Scratch. It's so, I wrote a blog post about it um, titled, I, if I could use only one, <laughs> if I, yeah, if I, had a, if I could only use one, because it would be my go-to. Um, even with my primary students, it's got a pretty low barrier of entry other than you kind of need to read because if you notice the blocks, they have words on them um, and a very high ceiling. You can do amazing things in Scratch. In fact, most of my students haven't even touched half of what they could do. In the top image, there's a project created by one of my first graders last year. Um, and the bottom image is a mission project. The first grader only had to use two blocks. They drew themselves, recorded sound, and put the two blocks together. The mission project, as part of a bigger uh, research project, um, they researched about their missions. The California missions is a huge social studies thing in fourth grade. Um, and they researched about their mission, and then they created a project in um, Scratch to talk and educate about their mission. This was my for this fourth grade class first time using Scratch, so they did a pretty phenomenal job with this. And they remember it fondly. Um, I had a sixth grader this just this week tell me how much fun it was. Um, uh, more. I have a link to my student scratch projects in the live binder, um, and a lot of them are curricular related, um, so you may want to go look at those. Scratch has an amazing community. If you're looking for ways to learn and teach how to use Scratch, um, check the Scratch Ed community. Um, it includes, one of the things it includes is the Scratch Creative Computing Guide, which are a series of lessons designed to teach Scratch. There are also some online courses that you can um, take as a teacher um, from Harvey Mudd and from the University of Northern Iowa. Um, they're great, and I've run through them. They give you good ideas on how to approach teaching Scratch. And uh, you'll often find yourself in the course with middle school students. The Scratch website itself has video tutorials and printable Scratch cards, which give you a great intro to how to use Scratch. Um, be watching Scratch maybe on a tablet in the future. Right now it's not. So if you're looking for tablet versions, I'd suggest 
checking out, um, I'm going to just throw out some things here. They are linked in the live binder. An app called Pionki, um, P-Y-O-N-K-E-E -E on um, iPads, Pocket Code on Android, and Tinker on um, iOS or Android. A few things about Tinker. Um, you might want to look into it. It works on all devices. And if you start something on one type of device, you can open that same project on another. Because as a teacher, you can set up classes um, and track progress. And then the st when the students log in, they can get at their projects from any device. So they could start it on um, an iPad at school and go home and use mom and dad's laptop at home to finish it. Um, they're also paid in and paid school and district accounts at Tinker that provide more actual curriculum for you as the teacher to use. Um, the free account doesn't come with much. You have to create your own, but, um, but it works uh, really well. Um, for those in mixed device classrooms, it's great. Hopscotch, just touch on that one really quickly. It's an iPad-only app. And I recommend it for third, fourth grade, and up. It requires reading, and it's different, somewhat different than the other apps. There are very few built-in characters. Um, you can use the few they have, plus anything you can type. So the emoticon keyboard becomes pretty important. There are no backgrounds. If you want one, you must draw it with code. There is no interface with the camera, and you can't record, so there are no voiceovers. So you have to be a little creative, but you can do amazing things in Hopscotch. Um, you can get, there's a, a, a uh, <coughs> Common Core and NGSS aligned Hopscotch curriculum guide available at gethopscotch.com slash resources. Um, there are also, um, there's also a great iBook that was published by Apple Distinguished Educators with curricular examples. The examples you see here is one that might be a, vo a vocabulary type lesson where you bring in, you're having it, um, bring it, you brought in some emoticons and then when they click on it, it gives you the vocabulary word. Might be great for an ESL student or you could do it with foreign language for someone learning, um, you know, Spanish for example. The one on the right is um, a row of houses, um, and it's using variables and things to use random colors and all of that, so it's a little more complex than it looks. Um, my friend Sam Patterson has a great video with fifth graders showing photosynthesis um, using hopscotch. It's called Modeling Photosynthesis in Hopscotch. He talks to the kids and shows their projects. So I check out those resources. Um, I'm at the point now where I want to move some of my students into text-based languages. Um, there's a big controversy that things like Scratch and Blockly and things like that are not real coding. They are. They're teaching the concept. But they're not something that a student could use if they really wanted to be a programmer or that they could use to make an interactive website, for example. At that point, you have to move into text-based languages. Um, beginning computer science courses, even at the college level, do use Scratch. Um, if you check out CS50 from Harvard, for example, you'll see that they start in Scratch. Uh, they get out of it fairly quickly, but they do start in Scratch. So it teaches valuable things. But when it's time to move on, you need to look for other alternatives. Um, this year, uh, what I like to do at Hour of Code is find new things. They're new to me, new to my students that we haven't used in the past, and try them at Hour of Code. Because if they fail, it's only an hour. You know, and then I can move on to something else. So this year I was looking for some text-based languages for my middle schoolers. And um, my middle schoolers, I use Khan Academy's compu um, computing um, uh, uh, course. It has videos, guided videos, and um, guided tutorials on how to uh, program in JavaScript. And they're actually using 
processing JS, which allows them to draw. Um, and they, they had a really great time working with that and making snowmen and stuff. They're currently working on their um, final drawing for this, and they'll be sharing them on their um, Google sites, which are linked from my blog. Uh, from my computer lab blog um, after the new year. So if you want to check those out after the new year, you'll see those. And so they're learning some JavaScript, and we're going to continue those. It worked fairly well. Um, another one that that works with jo works in JavaScript is Pencil Code. It's actually CoffeeScript, which is a little simpler than JavaScript. Doesn't need the semicolons, um, and it but it compiles to JavaScript. Pencil code is great um, in that their logins don't require a password. Um, and in fact, they ask that, you, that students not identify themselves in any way. It's an educational site. Um, and I know teachers that have used it with um, at classes as young as third grade. You can um, switch back and forth between blocks and text code. So it's kind of cool tool and it has like a drawing tutorial, a music tutorial, and then a game building tutorial um, built into the website. So it's kind of fun. Um, the other one that, that we used this year was called Trinket and that um, teaches Python. And my eighth graders used that. Um, and they enjoyed that. Again, they were doing exploring drawing, writing messages, and things like that. They're currently working on their final project. They're actually, they have homework over the break to finish that. Um, and they're either writing a poem or drawing something original. And then um, they're going to share those on their Google sites. I really like Trinket because you can embed the finished product along with their code on a website or a blog. And as a teacher, if you have an LMS, you could embed a trinket that's a starter project into um, your LMS. And then the students could sign into their accounts and remix that starter project. So um, Trinket's got some good tools built in for teachers. Um, they all have. Um, curriculum and help for the teachers, and they all do require logins. So um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Um, they're, they're very helpful. Um, going to a text-based language, is, it's a pretty big transition. And my students are kind of back at the learning to code because they know the concept of a loop, for example, but how you write it is different. And they're dealing with syntax errors now that they didn't have before. Um, I'm looking forward to when they're over that hurdle and can start um, doing more creation type things. And finally, oh, a couple things. Finally, app creation. My students want to make apps. <laughs> That's their number one request. The problem is it's hard to make apps. Um, especially iOS apps, which of course that's what my students want to make. <laughs> um, there are th there are three tools that I recommend, the for, and I've used the top two with students: MIT App Inventor. You can create um, Android apps with this. Um, it runs on desktops and laptops. Um, with this, uh, it can interface directly with an Android device if you have them. If you don't have devices, it runs with an emulator. If you're going to use the emulator, you have to install software so it wouldn't work on a Chromebook. Um, I believe it does work on a Chromebook if you have Android devices to pair. Um, it needs to be on the same Wi-Fi connection as the desktop or laptop. Um, and Touch Develop is another one. Oh, it's free, by the way. And you, log, you need to log in, but you can use your Google account if you're a Google App School. Touch develops another one I've used. It's from Microsoft. Um, it's also free. It's um, browser-based, and it runs on pretty much any device. I had students when we were using it, using, la using our desktop computers, using um, tablets, and using their uh, an iPod and using their phones. Um, you can create on those. Um, it creates web apps, but the cool thing is if you're on like an iPhone, when you have that web app, web app, you can say to add it to your home screen and it looks just like an app. Um, 
If you want to go further, you can also export the code to create um, iOS, Windows, and Andro Android apps through another tool. Um, my students never got that far, so I'm not sure what you'll run into with that. I know with iOS, you have to have a developer account in order to add it to the App Store, and those run $99 a year, which is above the budget that I would have for my students. So um, we, we never got that far. They just enjoyed adding them to their home screen and having it look like an, a real app. Um, both of these have, have a lot of curricular materials available for teachers. Um, there's a whole course, like at appinventor.org, there's a whole course on how to teach App Inventor. Touch Develop has a whole course on how to teach Touch Develop. The cool thing with Touch Develop is it starts out kind of block based, and, you, and there's three levels, and it ends up as a language based. So you can transition students and create apps at the same time. The last one, which I have not used, is, is I'm, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Codia is how I say it. It's an app on the iPad that lets you create apps for the iPad. Um, if you ever have played Cargobot, which is also an iPod app and um, iPad app, it, um, it was created entirely in Codia. Um, it costs, though, $14.99. Not sure if you can get any uh, volume discounts or not. Um, you're coding in a language called Lua, which is in the top 25 languages. And there are tutorials online for Lua, and you'd need them. It's a tougher coding environment. Um, it, I think it would be great in high schools that are looking for something, that have some kind of funding, and they're looking for something um, that lets you create iOS apps in a non, um, in a non uh, Apple environment. You don't have um, Apple desktops. You can't teach Swift and go at it that way. Um, so I haven't ever used that one. And last but not least is robots. Um, if you want to see excitements, bring out robots. There's something special about building code and seeing it actually make a robot do something that really engages students. There are a lot of options for fairly inexpensive robots these days. Um, the Lego Mindstorms are out of my price range, but these are not. Um, these are the ones that, that we're currently using. Um, on the upper left are Bbots. Bots are great for primary grades again. You program, program them by just clicking on buttons on them, and they are just arrows and a go button. And so you can teach cardinal directions, left, right, forward, back, um, with them. And they can, they, they're on a mat. They move 15 centimeters. You can make a grid out of uh, painter's tape and put anything in those grids or buy their mat, which is what you're looking at here, that has a, um, it has a transparent cover. So you can put anything underneath the cover, and then the V-Bots roll on top of it. Um, and you can, um, the kids can program it. it. At my school, they have to write the code first. And normally, they're paired. One of them writes the code using, as you can see on the picture, those command cards. Um, or they have to write it on paper before they code it in Bbot. And they can you know, stand up and move around so they can be facing the way Bbot would be facing, because it's tough. Once Bbot's turned, it's hard to know which way do they turn next time. Um, you can put anything in that mat. Uh, did you just finish a story? You want to know if the students remember the sequence. Put pictures from the story under that and program Bbot to go to those pictures in order. Um, you want, do you want them to review math facts, put numbers on the mat, and have students solve math problems and program Bbot to go to that? So you can program them um, to do much anything. If, you, if you're interested in the cost, and everybody always is, they're $89.95 each for the Bbot. There's a new one called Bluebot, Bluebot see-through, and you can program Bluebot with an, I, with an um, iOS app. Um, it costs $119.95. They do have quantity discounts. If you check the website, you can find those. 
On, on the bottom is Dash of Dash and Dot from Make Wonder. Um, they have big personalities. You can program them um, either with a Blockly app or the Wonder app, um, which I really like the Wonder app. It's fairly new. Um, if you're looking for things to do with Dash and Dot that tie into curricular areas and whatever, at the Make Wonder site, there's an ideas area. Um, it's, uh, you can look at that. It's makewonder.com slash play slash ideas. And there's an area for teachers at teachers.makewonder.com that have curricular ideas, how you can use them in the classroom with your students. Um, my kids built mazes. They were just practicing programming it. Um, what you see in the background, the, the blurred girls are my fifth graders because they were practicing using Dash so they could help at open house with the younger students using Dash and Dot. Um, what do they cost? Dash, the one you see, and Dash moves, Dot does not. Dash is $169.99 and Dot is $49.99. They interact together so Dot can make Dash do something. Dash can make Dot do something. So it's fun to have the pair, but if you're only going to buy one, buy Dash. Um, it looks like they're sold out, at least online. They're sold out on the Make Wonder site right now and on Amazon. Um, you, there are other places you can get them that may have them. Um, and they'll be back, I'm sure. And sometimes they run deals, so keep an eye on the website. Sign up for their newsletter and uh, get them when they're on sale. I would also suggest looking at eBay. Sometimes parents will buy them, not know what to do with them, and sell them. And you can get them for a pretty good discount there. Sphero. Um, who knew a ball shape could be so much fun and educational? Want, if you, for example, if you wanted to teach second grade about inclined planes, have them do some discovery using a Sphero. Um, Sam Patterson again wrote a great post called Programming Robots in Second Grade, um, on, and it's on teachercast.net, and it's about just that, where they use, they program spheros to see things like, you know, the speed matter getting up the plane, what about the angle of the plane, and things like that. Um, my fourth grade students had great aha moments last year when they were programming Sphero to discover the relationship between speed, time, and distance, which is one of their curricular um, objectives. And it kind of clicked when they were watching Sphero actually do that. Um, the, there are classic PDF lessons. Um, which are geared to fourth and fifth grade at sphero.com slash education. Or I would highly recommend right now to join for free the Lightning Lab for more ideas. Lightning, the Lightning app is the new app to program Sphero, and it's pretty slick. Um, and there's some great ideas there. Um, Morse code with fourth grade, for example, uh, programming a simulation of the solar system. Um, my eighth graders here that you see, these were seventh graders actually last year, are programming, they're programming a dance for Spiro. Um, they were actually listening to um, some music and coding. Um, they were using um, a, a specific app to do that. Now I'd probably have them do either the Tickle app or the Spark app, the new Lightning app, um, to code the dance. <clears throat> so what's the cost? $129.99 for the Spiro 2.0 or the Spark, which is kind of cool because you can see through the Spark. And it's kind of fun to watch it move and watch it try and keep itself level. Um, there are education discounts. You can get a 12-pack for $11.99.99. You do need devices to program both the Spiro and Dash and Dot. So you don't have devices, you can't program them. Um, they come with apps. As I tell people, the apps are free, the devices are not. Um, so you can download free apps, or you can use the Tickle app, which is a great little app, to program these. And it's very, very Scratch-like. So if your students have used Scratch, then it'll be very familiar. And that's it. <laughs> You can contact me. 
um, on Twitter, via email, my website, my blog. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions now or through any of those um, avenues in the future if you have questions on how you want to implement things. And I went way long because I always have more information than I need. <laughs> I did manage to capture a few questions. I think this was codable. Uh, it seemed to this particular person that the two middle school courses were not accessible unless you went through the training. Is that is that the case with the codable courses? Um, I think they were talking the code.org courses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, training training for those is only available through school districts who sign mm -hmm. up, but you can use the courses even if you are have not um, you know taken the training. And both of those are based on things that are outside of code.org. Mm -hmm. uh, Bootstrap world, you can just go directly there. They also offer trainings. And um, if you go to the Star Logo site or a site called Project Guts, it's projectguts.org, they have a whole curriculum also on CS and science. So mm -hmm. you don't have to take their trainings, but they are helpful if your district is signed up. Okay. Do you use Alice or other 3D? Um, I we've dabbled with Alice. The mm -hmm. problem that I've had with um, talking about Alice it, with people is you have to install it. Um, mm -hmm. The minute it becomes an installed thing um, on laptops or desktops, a lot of times schools can't do it, mm -hmm. um, and there's. Uh, so I do like it because it's 3D. My students actually were very engaged with it um, because they're not, they weren't the flat sprites like Scratch has. Um, mm -hmm. So they really enjoyed um, the 3D. Have you used CS First curriculum from Google? I think somebody in the room said that they had used it. Um, yeah, CS First is, is um, based around Scratch, mm -hmm. and it's a great curriculum. It's it's really good. Um, it's a it's a, for after school, but you can also use it in the classrooms. I know a lot of after school clubs that use it. Um, they're very guided lessons, so it's a it's another great way to learn how to teach Scratch. And they're arranged around themes. So there may be, um, like I know for Hour of Code, they were, you were programming um, something in a boat, um, a conversation in a boat. Mm -hmm. um, there's also things around um, art and music and things like that. So they're, they're very engaging. Again, for probably fourth grade and up. Um, Though you can use Scratch with Younger, but again, you have to be able to read fairly well. Mm -hmm. How many Spiros do you have for a class? I actually only have three, um, and I put groups of kids on them. Um, I have had up to, I, I would prefer to have one Sphero for every two kids. Mm -hmm. I think that works the best. I would not want a one-to-one -one thing with Sphero. Um, two to three work the best. I often will have to have, you know, more than that. Or I will divide it up where one group works on Sphero today and another group will work on it the next time uh -huh. so that um, I don't have to have, you know, 10 kids on a Sphero. Right. Yeah. Well, those are the questions that I, that, yes, it does. It does sound like a great donor's choose proposal. Um, those were the questions that I was able to capture. I'm not sure if anybody has anything else to ask. 
you can type in the chat or uh, if you know your mic works with Collaborate, you can raise your hand and you can ask on mic. Let's see a few people are typing. They may be typing in some other questions. All right, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up then. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Vicky. Um, Thank you for having me. The, Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Uh, these are the upcoming shows. We are off on winter break for the next two weeks, December 26th and January 2nd. And then on January 9th, the first week back, week back is our year in, a, in review show, we, where we will recognize and celebrate everybody who presented in 2015. So that's our Happy New Year show. Um, that's our seventh anniversary. Show. On Saturday, Peggy, you're going to take over with this? Okay. I would love to just say a couple words about this because I wanted everyone to know about the Student Technology Conference. It's coming up on Saturday, January 30th. So we won't have a show that day because this is an awesome conference, um, second year, I think, for it, and it's organized by students in grades 6 through 12, and the, the presenters are students, sometimes with their teachers and sometimes just on their own. But I wanted you to know about it now because the deadline for submission of presentations is January 16th. So that's something you might want to work on and think about having your students present for that conference. It's always amazing. So be sure to check that out. Um, and the also want to remind you that you can learn about all of these conferences on Steve Hargadon's Learning Revolution site. So um, that link is always in our live binder and you can go in and check out for updates and things like that. So thank you so much, Vicki, for this awesome hour, hour plus, and now we all have our homework. Uh, to do for an extended period of time, but your resources will help us to stay motivated and get the help we need. You're quite welcome, and thanks again for having me. Returning briefly to the Learning Revolution Project, another thing that's available here is to host your own webinar series where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate classroom session, and as long as your session is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at the form that will be posted in the chat as well as the resource in the um, Classroom 2.0 Live site and the resource tab in the Live Binder. You can also nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. As you exit the session, the survey should open. There are three ways to get to, to this, the direct link in the chat box or in the live binder. As you do that, at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate, but make sure you ask to submit your, your personal email address to request this rather than a school email address. Schools tend to block it. Recordings are available in a video collection and audio collection on iTunes U as well as the RSS feed from the uh, Classroom 2.0 Live website. Again, special thanks to Vicki Sedgwick, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming.